What is up, everybody? Welcome back to Stacks by the Numbers. Today is Thursday. The market closed. We're coming to you later today after hours, 7 p.m. roughly, Eastern Standard Time. These companies that we predicted earlier have reported earnings, so let's see how they traded and how right we were. Again, I do not hide on this channel, and uh, we always go back and we see how we did, what we got right, what we got wrong, and how we can improve moving forward. So first company, Broadcom Incorporated, ticker symbol AVGO, listed here on the NASDAQ. The stock what got up over 50 points today, above $1,400, having a nice 4% pop here going into these earnings. And rightfully so, because we looked at this earlier today, and we can see that just the consistency and how extremely profitable, in my opinion, how profitable this company is. But just this growth that we're seeing getting up to above the 9 billion mark apparently acquisition finalized here with VMware that added 2 billion in change bringing this company to above the 11 billion estimate mark and as you see the company came out and reported 11.961 billion beating on the EPS side again reporting 1099 a share on estimates of 1040 beating by over five and a half percent and uh, basically they supposedly kept the company down because they were talking about some slight drops in profitability. However, it seemed like they were forecasting pretty nice growth on the revenue side. So the stock did take a hit immediately, was down, um, yeah, like three and a half, four percent. And then, as you see, bounced back up, actually went green and then dipped back down. And you can see that we're down about three percent right now after hours. But let's check what's going on here. Yes, we beat on the EPS side over the last four quarters, beat EPS four times, well above expectations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Look, I love it. All of these things. I gotta love these Zach's articles, man. They go on forever about nonsense. But that's just my opinion. So they said that they were going to post around 50 billion. I'm trying to find it here. They were saying that they were going to post around 50 billion for the year. And supposedly, yeah, so he continues to anticipate a consolidated revenue advancing 40% year on year to $50 billion. Streets looking for 50, oh, 1 billion. I saw another post that was saying 50 point. Uh, to 1 billion but if the company consistently keeps growing and keeps coming in above expectations like they've been doing then chances are they will come above that whatever 501 billion 50.21 billion doesn't matter chances are the company will probably looking like it anyway looking like they're going to hit that 50 billion plus mark and again they just closed out the year less than 36 billion now for 24 we're expecting 50 billion so company the growth cannot be denied here and you can see revenue in semiconductor solution segment increased four percent year over year to 739 billion sales in the infrastructure software division uh because of vmware as it says surged 153 percent to 4.57 billion broadcom completed its acquisition of vmware in november uh acquisition of vmware is accelerating revenue growth in our infrastructure software segment Quote, strong demand for our networking products in AI data centers, of course, as well as custom AI accelerators from hyperscalers are driving growth in our semiconductor segment. So also the company says, quote, we have started to pay down debt beginning with $3 billion to date in 2024 and expect to continue to pay down debt in fiscal year 2024. So in my opinion, it sounds very, very positive to me, and chances are over time, in my eyes, the company will probably continue to grow in value. Uh, if you're stepping in here on the dip, I, in my eyes, understandable. We've been seeing that consistent uh, earnings growth coming from a lot of other stocks as well, because I know initially when I looked at it, again, at less than $36 billion for the year. Look at that. Look at the scale of profitability, though. Ridiculous was 12% in 2020. Now we're up to almost 40% for 2023. Absolutely insane. But as you see, revenue coming in 
sub 36 billion market cap 650 billion right so immediately initially i should say when i first looked at it the way i do uh, kind of reminded me of something like a crowd strike right was up very very high for a while have been consistently beating estimates top and bottom lines increasing guidance moving forward but when I, when I looked at CrowdStrike, again, I kind of did that revenue to market cap comparison. And in my opinion, even though the company was doing well and chances are would beat earnings, I felt that the stock should maybe just sell off a couple of percentage points or maybe even remain flat. And what we saw with CrowdStrike is obviously the opposite. They came out, they beat top and bottom line, and they bumped up forecast moving forward. So the stock ended up chunking up 16% or whatever the heck it was, and I got that one wrong. So when looking at Broadcom today... I, you know, tried to remember what just happened, and in my opinion now, I said based off of the consistency that this company has been beating earnings and how nicely they're growing year over year, I would say AVGO calls, and as you see, the stock first went down, then we came back up, and it basically got flat, and now we're slightly red, so it's funny because the move that I thought I would see with CrowdStrike didn't happen, and then I expected a mirror move on AVGO when comparing it with CrowdStrike, and now AVGO is actually performing after hours the way I thought CrowdStrike would. So I found that pretty funny, but wrong at the end of the day. AVGO down 2.7%. I said, in my opinion, calls. Another one that I got wrong here was Costco. Costco apparently came out and missed on the revenue side, as we see here. Nice beat on the EPS side, posting 371 a share, estimates of 362, beating by about 2.5%. Revenue coming in light, 668.5 million, missing by over 1%. Estimates were 59.111 billion, and the company reported 58.442 billion so came in a little bit light there the stock's down three and a quarter percent in my opinion though overall even if it didn't move even if it was flat right here and held this value in my opinion up here at this value we could say that the company is undervalued because of course looking back here at 23 we can see 242 billion in revenue the company has a market cap of around 350 billion so we're trading less than one and a half times annual revenue and the company Consistently beating on the EPS side. Again, slight miss here on the revenue side. The PE could be viewed as a little high. was up there north of 50. But the way I'm looking at it is, in my opinion, I, I do think Costco continues to grow. And even if you bought in recently and now you're down, in my opinion, chances are you're probably holding it for the long term. And in the long term, in my opinion, I do think it continues to grow. And... Um, I think that should be really, in my opinion, should be about two and a half times this number, believe it or not. So, you know, that would be what, four, eight, that would be 600, 600, so a little less than a double. So that would bring us to like, uh, yeah, maybe like around 1300 and change per share. In my opinion, I do think that's uh, where the stock should go. And I understand some people may say like, oh, you know, you can't compare it to like those other tech stocks, you know, trading at those high multiples. But my argument will be this. Um, also, they, they compare. For, wait, hold on. First, I'm trying to say like three ideas at once. First of all, when we look at a tech stock that's bringing in hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue, the market cap is usually close to a trillion, if not above a trillion. If you look at stocks like Amazon, Microsoft, Google, obviously, right? And we know it's also because of not only the continued growth and the future guidance, but also more importantly, because of their profit margins. So if we're favoring higher multiples based off profits, but not necessarily based off revenue, even though that's important too, then yes, I agree. This is a hiccup missing on the revenue side. And having the stock down 3 or 4%, understandable. However, beat on the profitability side again, and looking at not only annual growth of the net margin percentage, now up to 2.6% for 23, but also on the quarterly side, yes, bouncing around 25, 26, 24, back up to 27, and now 275%. So technically, if we 
are very confident that over time, the revenue will continue to grow and the company will beat earnings more times than not, while at the same time, they've now recently been increasing their profitability, which is the argument which is to why tech stocks trade at higher multiples, right? You see where I'm going? I understand, again, they missed on revenue, but over time, in my opinion, Costco really should inevitably keep growing. Uh, that That's the way I'm looking at it. And again, there's a one-year chart right so that's what i mean looking at where the company's been how consistent for the most part they are over time how nicely they're growing everyone talks that everyone talks about their memberships oh i go to costco i love costco blah, blah, blah. so obviously i was pretty bullish on costco however this is what makes earnings difficult as well because if the stock was not on this massive run here since november again coming back here november starts the stock's at 550 you know, now it's almost $800. So we took it up. We, we really took it up. And this is the one downside about this situation. If you really take a stock up and then you have a slight negative, even if it's not a miss, even if they forecast potentially moving forward that like the operating margin might drop by half a percent. That's it. If you're trading near those highs and we just ran you up with the rest of the market, then any negative reason you give us, we're going to bring you right back down. And you can see that we dropped down almost back to where we gapped up right there. It looks like at about 752.60, 753. And you can see the stock right now, 756. Uh, what was the low? low 745 and a half so we do also look like uh looks like we're forming potentially a little bear flag here so we could kind of rise up back here and then break down to uh the 740s again but again overall over time i personally do like costco and you know this is why earnings are rough because we look at costco we see it's a brand name we see it's been growing the stock's up at all-time highs oh yeah costco is probably going to beat and then what happens they miss slightly on revenue stock takes three and a half percent hit or whatever so you know we get some right we get some wrong other than those though a lot of other good calls coming in again avgo uh immediately if you were an options player but again options were probably very expensive on avgo but if you were an options player i would still say in my opinion to hold on tight technically they did beat earnings and that's why again we saw the stock went down and then rebounded and flattened out. So AVGO may actually continue to climb over the next couple of days. Costco, if they do keep it down or flat for a month or so, in my eyes would be understandable. They technically did miss earnings. Coming over here to DocuSign, ticker symbol DOCU listed here on the NASDAQ. Stock took a 2% pop today going into earnings. And as we see, the company beats on the EPS and the revenue estimates here. It's stock up over 11% right now after hours, trading at about 59.5, up about 6 points. We can see estimates on the EPS side, 64.7 cents. Company comes out and posts 76 cents a share, beating by 17.5%. And I know that this was a company that Wall Street was worried about because they were on the downtrend and everyone was supposedly waiting for the u-turn and the bottom and the recovery to take place and now supposedly it looks like it is taking place so the stock is being rewarded here again currently up almost 11 percent here on the revenue side estimate 698.34 million the company comes out and posts 712.386 million beating by over 14 million roughly two percent on the beat and we can see now we have a market cap. Uh, it was close to 11. Now we're up 10%. So now we're around 12. The PE is very high. It's sitting here well over 200. But the company has been increasing on the profitability side very nicely and beat again today. And we can see that they're coming in well above expectations. Look at this, 17%, 24%, almost 10%, and then 29%. So it seems like the profitability side and now the revenue side as well is climbing much, much faster than Wall Street anticipated. You can see the last quarter, they just got above that 700 million mark. Looks like the uh, net margin was making that cup recovery and boom, popped up to the next level, getting above 5.5%. And now we can see again, the company post above 700 million, 712.386. So in my opinion, very nice quarter here for DocuSign of 8% over the same period last year okay we're moving we're moving mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Non-gap billings, 833 million versus 761 and a half million, estimated by five analysts on average. Revenue professional services, 16.7 versus the estimate of 16.8. Okay. Reported number represents a year-over-year -year change of over 5%. Okay, very nice. Revenue subscription, 695, 68 million compared to 681. Average estimate of seven analysts. Reported number represents 8.1% change year-over-year. -year. Gross profit, 590 million versus the estimate of 572 million. So this is what I mean. A lot of these numbers are five, seven, eight percent above what an, what the average analyst, I guess, were expecting. Lost three point five seven million versus lost three oh six million. Okay, lost a little bit wider there on the non-gap professional services, but overall seems like a pretty decent beat for DocuSign. And again, I know a lot of people may have thought that the company would uh, struggle. But apparently, the, the turnaround is real. And uh, again, the EPS moving very, very nicely. And that jump up there above $700 million, in in my opinion, is a very, very good sign. Top consensus revenue estimates four times over the last four quarters. We're nice and consistent. Look at this. These articles just go on and on and on. Estimates for the coming quarters, current fiscal year, change in the days ahead, current consensus EPS, estimate 66 on 702 for the coming quarter, 286 on 2.9 billion in revenue for the year. Okay, we have no quarterly earnings of 58 per share in its upcoming report has remained unchanged over the last days. Oh no, this is Giga. Randomly randomly throwing out oh yeah there's another stock that we like but that's okay but overall as you see here q4 revenue tops estimates as turnaround efforts pay off i believe they said they were going to potentially also cut the workforce as well resulting uh, prior turnaround efforts are resulting in a company on stronger footing Uh, free cash flow was 248.6 compared to 113 million in the same period a year earlier. For the current quarter, DocuSign forecast revenue between 704 and 708 million. Analysts expected 700.5 million. So it looks like they're on pace to beat revenue for this upcoming quarter now as well. For fiscal 25, got it for revenue in the range of 292, 293. Analysts pulled forecast 291. So if they slightly come in above expectations as they've been doing, then chances are they will eclipse that $291 billion mark and it will look even better, in my opinion. After it disclosed plans to reduce its workforce by about 6%. It's amazing how you're hearing the economy is great and you got this whole build back better nonsense, yet you're constantly seeing that all of these companies are trimming their workforce. Part of a broader effort to achieve multi-year growth target in independent public company. DocuSign had hired advisors to explore a potential sale. If someone's willing to buy it, in my opinion, that means there is value there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, yeah, DocuSign, not too shabby. Uh, up 11% here still. And, again, the PE is a little high. If we're looking at... What the company said, right? Company said what? Around 2.9 billion for the year. And we have a market cap now of about probably about 12 billion. So we're trading about 4x that number with a pretty high PE. So now that the stock took that next jump higher and is sitting, we'll call it around $60 a share, we could potentially flatten out and just kind of hang out there for a while. But, you know, that's just my prediction. Switch over here to the gap. Ticker symbol GPS listed here on the New York Stock Exchange. Apparel company. We know a lot of apparel companies have been getting kept down, beaten up, and the company actually came out. Beats on the top and bottom lines. On the EPS side, very impressive. Uh, estimates of 22.5 cents. The company posts 49 cents a share, over 100% beat there. And we can see on the revenue side, estimates of 4.215 billion. The company posts 4.298 billion beating by over 80 million or almost 2%. The stock went from the low 1930s, it looks like, 
immediately spiked up to 21 and a half, was up nicely, and has slowly begun to step down, now sitting, kind of hanging out above $20 a share, up 5% right now. But I believe they forecasted kind of just flat growth. Mm -hmm. And again, what are we seeing here with these apparel companies? Like I always say, it seems like if there is a reason that they could potentially keep them down or beat them up, then they will take it. And with the gap, again, they did beat. So I understand if we kind of stay up here and slowly rally to uh, 21, 22. But, uh, you know, if it doesn't do much after that and then potentially start selling off, I actually wouldn't be too surprised, in my opinion. Uh, all right, we were talking about the flatness. And again, these articles go on forever. Here we go. Company reported quarterly earnings of 49 cents a share significantly improved from a loss of 75 cents in the prior year's quarter. Company bottom line results came in above estimates of 23. Comparable sales or comp sales were flat on a year-over-year -year basis, right? They don't want to hear flat. They want to hear at least a 1-2%. Store sales were up 4%, while online sales fell 2% year over year. Very interesting. Old Navy sales were up 6%. Gap sales were down 5%. Banana Republic sales were down 5%. And Athleta, Athleta, I don't know, sales were down 4% year over year. So of these four brands, only Old Navy was up. So that also doesn't really look too hot, but we got a Quarterly dividend here, 15 cents. Company ended the quarter with 1.9 billion in cash, up 54% on a year-over-year -year basis. So, company has cash on hand. They obviously have some maneuverability. So, I, I don't even know if if it's really just more of, oh, they need to do more marketing, more advertising, and put the money there. Or if it's just, I, I just feel like now there's just so much competition in the apparel space. And I just feel like it's a tug of war almost going back and forth. Like, oh, this quarter we had growth. It was a good quarter. Oh, now this quarter you had growth. It was a good quarter, better quarter for you than us. You understand? So in my opinion, I don't know. It seems hard to tell, hard to call, but um, the, the flatness is what, um, in my opinion, the flatness is what may keep this company not running to the moon, if we will. Gap expects both first quarter and full year 2024 net sales to be roughly flat on a year-over-year -year basis. Gross margin expected to expand 100 basis points first quarter. The company also got it for at least 50 basis points of margin expansion for the full year of 2024. So again, technically a beat. And of course, forecasting flatness is not necessarily a positive. But of course, it's better than forecasting a decline like we recently saw with Victoria's Secret, whose stock dropped 30% or whatever the heck it was. But uh, the gap, obviously, if they stay in line or potentially in the next one to two quarters are able to say, oh, yeah, by the way, you know, we're moving, you know, we're, we're making better sales than expected. We're moving along further than we thought. So, you know, by the way, we're not forecasting, uh, you know, flat guidance anymore. And now we're potentially coming in above guidance. In my opinion, that'll really, that, that'll be what really helps to pump the stock up because again you can see we had the pop after earnings and then we dropped and then just kind of flattened out right so we could potentially have a pop and then a drop and then just kind of flatten out right so we may find ourselves right back here at this original starting point of about 19 and a third but uh we'll see what the market wants to do it's been up since these earnings back here in may and it does look like it filled that gap there and then kind of flattened out waiting for these earnings. And again, we're having a slight bump, but we're kind of mixed as well. You can see where these gaps are. That's kind of where the stock is now, right? So we basically filled these gaps. But let me see the numbers again. 7 billion, the PE is very high. Profitability has been raging. 
And of course, again, just looking at the numbers, of course, we can try to make the argument that the company is undervalued. We're bringing in, you know, 10, 15, 16 billion for the year, and you're telling me the stock is worth 7 billion. But again, you know, uh, we could have a potential debt situation. Let me look. Yeah, the debt is 6 billion. It's been declining, though. And again, look, the company ended about $1.35 billion in cash. Now we got $1.9 billion in cash. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I would really keep beating them up that much. Um, like, if you told me, you know, now that uh, the stock will open at around 20 and, you know, a month later it'll be 22, 23, 24, I wouldn't necessarily call you crazy. Uh, again, PE a little high. We have been beating up these retail stocks, these apparel companies, these footwear companies. But if Gap is able to, for the most part, seems like consistently come in above expectations, slight miss there, back to back miss, three misses. So, yeah, I can understand as to why three misses in a row. I can understand why the stock was all the way beaten down and then went on the tear that it has been on. Even missing there, you can see the immediate reaction was down for a couple of days and then it popped and just started raging. But again, this was during the summer when the markets were raging. And you can see August, September, October, that's when the sell-off happened. And it sold off for most of that time and then sort of rallying the end of October. Yeah, I don't know. In my opinion, I... Probably similar to something like an Under Armour... Well, actually, I don't know now. I don't know if I want to compare it to Under Armour. Let me see. Under Armour, again, as you see, this was my projected path. We seem to be a couple of months behind. But yeah, we can see as of late, miss earnings. Beat, 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 beat. See, so that's what I mean. This whole time, and then when we looked at it, this is why I thought that it would really get up here no problem and as of late they brought the stock up to about nine and a half and then of course the company had to shoot themselves in the foot and miss on the revenue side if that miss didn't happen you probably would have started to have like this move and it would have uh chances are got back up to double digits of course anything can happen uh, it does seem like, in my opinion, the, these apparel companies have been gaining a little bit more momentum and attention here in the last month or two. So we could still see growth in something like UAA and, of course, in something like GPS, the Gap. So in my opinion, technically, I did say call, so I got that one right. But overall, like I said, if you, if you want to take a position in GPS for the longer term, uh, we can't necessarily call you crazy because uh, there, there may be value there. Looking at Big Bear AI, ticker symbol BBAI, of course I got this one wrong. The one time I just blindly throw out a call prediction on a stock just because it's in the AI sector, supposedly trying to follow the trend of every other tech stock, essentially, that's been reporting and, and been seeing pops when they don't deserve it, in my opinion. So I came out, I said BBAI calls, and of course the company makes me look like a fool, and they miss on the EPS side by a wide margin. Estimates were a loss of 5.2 cents a share, the company losing 14 cents a share. And of course, on the revenue side, I would say, first of all, in my opinion, green flag that they got back above that 40 million mark. <clears throat> and um, just looking at the estimates here, 42.7 million, you can see they missed by a little over 2 million, about 5%. But I was looking at the drop off in revenue, right? We have three or four misses on the EPS side. And um, I, I believe we have slight growth there year over year. But again, you can see the company was 40 million, got up to 42, and then dropped to 38, and then 34. And when I initially looked at the stock, I said, in my opinion, this kind of you know in my mind i may not have said it on the video but in my mind i said at eh, looking kind of rough right realistically i would probably play puts on this but 
because it's a tech stock AI company. I figured that even if it was a bad quarter, if they forecasted growth or strong demand, then the stock would probably rage anyway. And obviously that is not what happened. And the stock right now is sub $3 down 83 cents, about 22% right back here. And you can see we were in this long-term symmetrical triangle and then we had the breakout and we popped up and we got up to almost $5 and then we started to drop back down and now we're right here. So in my opinion, chances are it's probably going to fill that gap and retest this 20-day moving average potentially of about two and a half. And then because it was a premature breakout and then we have a negative catalyst, we may actually see the stock pull back into around this mid-range of the symmetrical triangle of around $2, potentially sub $2. This top fib right here is about $1.98. And then you can see that right at the apex of this triangle, before we had our premature breakout, the apex is right at next quarter's earnings in May, roughly estimates uh, for the first week of May coming up here with estimates back up to 42.57 million. So now after taking a hit in the revenue, dropping into the low 30s and slowly clawing back from 33 to 38, now this quarter they posted 40. So now this next quarter, if they can come out, in my opinion, and post like 43, 44 million and beat this revenue number without losing two too much money then in my opinion it should pop upwards out of this symmetrical triangle and get back into the threes and potentially fours but of course we'll cross that bridge when we get to it but yeah right now the company for the last year still dealing with some losses 155 million in revenue so trading about 4x that number and again, a company with this with these wide losses like this and this inconsistency, in my opinion, could potentially trade about two times that number, which would bring the market cap to around 300 million, which would be roughly a 50% drop from here, which would be right around sub $2, which is why I personally came up with that price target. But hey, don't jump down my throat. I'm just reporting the news and giving my opinion. And uh, if your hype about this company again i understand cheap stock right it's only a couple of dollars a share they're in the ai space i get it believe me i get it that's why i said in my opinion calls and the company made me look like a fool so if you did like it up there in the threes now technically all you can eat at sub three so you should be pretty pumped about that last one no second to last one uh swibby Smith & Wesson Brands, ticker symbol SWBI, listed here on the NASDAQ. This is a company that we're seeing, again, this is a firearm company, by the way. This is a company that we're seeing here, a nice 8.6% uh, pop after hours, up over a point, going from sub 13.5, now north of 14.5. And, and the company comes out, they beat on the top and bottom lines here, uh, EPS estimates of 11 cents a share. The company comes out and posts 19 cents a share, beating by over 70%. And we can see on the revenue side, 133.565 million on the revenue side. They come out and they post almost just shy of 137 and a half million. So the company came out, beats on the top and bottom lines. They also say that the profit drops on higher costs and expenses. Uh, however... Chief Executive Mark Smith says, quote, we continue to expect the firearm market to experience healthy demand through the 2024 election cycle. So I basically just went out on the limb and I was seeing what was happening here with the recent immigration taking place. And of course, like I mentioned, there's a lot of crime happening. And of course, it's not every city and not every state, but some places they are not necessarily taking care of it the way they should, they should supposedly be. So people are now kind of saying to themselves listen if it hits the fan and no one's going to come to save me i got to protect myself i got to protect my family so people in my opinion anyway that's kind of the vibe i'm getting people went out they purchased their firearms and of course we're seeing smith and wesson beating estimates but this right here we expect the firearm market to experience healthy demand through the 2024 election cycle so the way i'm looking at it is it's very interesting because a lot of people i know if you're into politics you could make the point you know all the countries like right there about on the tipping point about to either go off the cliff or we're, you know we're going to get saved and we're going to get pulled back to safety so it's kind of an interesting dynamic especially when we're looking at a company like smith and wesson that can actually benefit off of this this uh turmoil and and this kind of unknown future that could be unfolding in front of us for for the u.s anyway here in the states i'm talking and it's interesting because it is an election year 2024 and i feel like you have people who 
may, like I said, may not like firearms, but may see what's happening with the influx of migrants and, and the crime rates rising. So they said, you know what, you know, I, I may have never liked guns, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to buy a firearm for myself and for my family. And now it seems like regardless of who wins, you can make the argument that firearm sales, as stated here by Mark Smith, may remain healthy. Because if you think about it, if, well, it looks like Trump's going to be the front runner, right? So we're potentially going to have Biden versus Trump. I know a lot of people are saying Biden might not be up to it and might not be the candidate, but obviously we cross that bridge when we get to it. But right now we look at uh, potentially Biden versus Trump, right? And the way you look at it is very, very, very interesting because if it's Biden, then if you're looking to get a firearm, you can make the argument for it, right? Because you can say, well, again, you know, the migrants came pouring in, crime increased. So if Biden wins, I'm going to buy more firearms. Understandable. And on the flip side, you have Trump, who for the most part seems pretty pro Second Amendment. And even when they asked him about like newer and tougher gun regulations, he said it was it's a slippery slope that it's it's hard to even discuss. Because as soon as you mention these things, you're, you're, you know, you're technically teetering on infringing on the Second Amendment. So it seems like Trump is very pro-Second Amendment, which in turn would fuel the patriotism to go out and get a firearm. You, you understand what I'm saying? So that's why it's very, very interesting here in an election year, especially for a company like Smith & Wesson. Because as I said, if, if if one guy wins, you can say, oh, it's going to get worse, so you buy a firearm. If the other guy wins, you can say, oh, he loves America, he loves the Second Amendment, so I'm going to buy a, I'm gonna buy more firearms, right? So, very, very interesting year for Smith & Wesson. And overall, in my opinion, I actually think the stock is undervalued, even after this move here. Again, bringing in $137 million for the quarter. Uh, we have a market cap of only $600 million. So we're almost in line with annual revenue to market cap comparison. And our PE is sitting here at around 20. I know the stock is up, obviously, so these numbers are going to readjust. But I, I, I think you can appreciate what I'm saying. And again, even if you're not that involved in politics, um, you, you may not agree with how I just broke that down. And that's fine. But it is what it is, right? It, it is what it is. So, last company here, Marvell Technology. This one I actually had a pretty strong feeling was going to miss. I listed those six, seven stocks earlier, and I said basically calls for all of them and puts for Marvell. So, what we're seeing here, Marvell ran up about 4.5% here going into these earnings, and now we can see a drop of about 7.5%, dropping about 6.5 points. Let's check the numbers here. The company comes in with a very, very slight miss here on the eps side posting 46 cents on estimates of 46.2 cents not quite sure if i'd beat them up for that uh estimates on the revenue side 1.421 billion they post 1.427 billion beating by over 5 million a little less than half a percent here but i believe i believe that they mentioned some negatives here honestly no disrespect to zach's i don't want to look at another zach's article because they always talk about like their ratings and their site and what other stock is in the sector that they like better like forget about that i just need the news updates here so ai trend yep stock dropping projects revenue of 1.15 billion at midpoint while well, analysts tracked been looking for 1.38 billion okay that's a big miss um Company also expects adjusted earnings per share of 18 to 28 cents, while the fact set consensus was 41 cents. All right, so we are much less profitable than we first thought, with potentially the revenue coming in light as well moving forward. The company expects low single-digit sequential growth in the data center business for the current quarter and projects that both AI and standard data cloud centers will drive growth cloud data centers excuse me will drive growth but management called out various areas of weakness quote while we are forecasting soft demand impacting consumer carrier infrastructure and enterprise networking in the near term we expect revenue declines in these end end uh, in these end markets to be behind us after the first quarter and project a recovery in the second half of the fiscal year 
So that tells me that we could obviously see some weakness and some softness for the next one, potentially two quarters, and then project a recovery in the second half of the fiscal year. Well, Marvell's overall revenue was nearly flat. Semiconductors saw a much faster growth in its data center business, which benefits from the AI spending rush, of course, of course. Quote, we see, we see exciting new opportunities ahead of us, growth generative AI applications, positive uplift from increased investment in inferencing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Up 1% from a year before and roughly in line with estimates. 38% sequential growth in its data center business. Wow, very nice. Whereas its guidance had called for upwards of 30% growth. Okay. Year-over-year -year growth in revenue for data and market was 54%. Posted a 392.7 million net loss, equating to 45 cents a share. A year before, it lost 15 million. Huh. Okay. Well... That's moving in the wrong direction. Earned 46 cents a share matching estimates. Also announced board of directors had authorized a $3 billion boost to the company's stock buyback program, adding to the roughly $300 million that remains available under the existing repurchase authority. So the old adage is, if they're announcing a stock buyback program, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for you. But remember... Sometimes they also kind of do it to keep up appearances and try to keep up the price of the stock. So not necessarily saying that Marvell is going to fall off a cliff and that's what the board is doing. Because again, what, what they're, they're basically telling you, like, yeah, the next three, five, six months may be rough. And then the second half, you know, we're going to turn it around and pick it up. And, you know, we're still forecasting, you know, at least the same revenue or potentially slight growth moving forward. So that's what I mean. Not the end of the world. However, like we always say, if you've been trending upward and you're trading at a high multiple and then you come out and you got one negative, two little negatives, even though it may not be the end of the world, if your stock can take a hit, your stock more than likely will take a hit. And that's what you're seeing here. Again, we had a market cap up here, 73 and a half billion as of close. And last year, the company brought in a sub six billion. So you know, they were trading, what, what's that, a 12, about 12 times yearly revenue. And again, the company comes out and apparently we have big losses, slight miss on the EPS side. Again, I really don't think that was, that was the red flag. I think it was the, um, the miss, this right here. For the first fiscal quarter, projects revenue of 1.15 billion, while analysts were looking for 1.38, and also light EPS 18 to 28 estimates of 41. Right. So again, the the AI boost, awesome data center growth, phenomenal, and in the long term, it could probably continue to grow as it's been doing, in my opinion. But again, we have forecasting soft demand, and again, uh project a recovery in the second half of the fiscal year. So Marvell, MRVL taking a hit. I technically, I called put, so I got that one right. But uh, overall, I just think, you know, just look at that. You know, excellent recovery there throughout 2023, you know. So the company is doing some things right. So you could have the sell-off and, and even pull back here to the low 70s. But again, if you like the company... Now, if you didn't have a position, like I always say, don't you know you shouldn't be so negative about it. You should view it as an opportunity. Say, okay, now oh it's at 85, now it's at 78. Okay, we'll give it a little bit of time. Maybe when it hits like that, that 75, sub 75 mark, I'll start piecing my way in. You know, so that's what that's why I always say try not to view unless of course you bought calls for this Friday. Then I understand if if you're sitting there you know with sour puss, but. Overall, not the worst numbers we've seen, but Marvell, again, will potentially continue to struggle for the next one, potentially two quarters, and saying they could project to turn it around second half of the year.
And that's it. Those are all the companies we look for. So I'm going to end it there. Once again, stocks by the numbers. Thank you so much for taking the time, watching the video, hearing me out for a little bit. I appreciate that. Do me a favor. As everyone else says, it's like a nervous tick that every content creator has, but apparently it actually helps which is why everyone says it, I guess. So do me a favor, like the video, subscribe to the channel, all that, share the video. You know, that helps out the algorithms and everything like that. But more importantly, moving forward, like I always say, I understand that markets are rocky, they are volatile, and they are very uncertain. So I want to wish all of you success. I hope everyone makes a couple of dollars. Thanks for stopping by. You guys have a good day.